Well, hello. Welcome back to the 9000. I'm Carl. Today I'm going to do a Fusion 360 project. This is the first one I've done on my channel here. And I'm going to show you how I made this little star knob, little threaded knob with a quarter 20 bolt in it and a 3D printed surround knob that's got a neat feature uh, in that it snaps together. And I'll take this apart for you here. And you can see on the inside there are three holes with these 3D printed plastic snap pins that have a bit of a taper to them. And I'll snap them in there. And I'll put a quarter 20 bolt through the hole. And the back has the same three tapered holes in it. And I'll put that on and snap. And it holds together pretty nicely. And what's neat about this, uh, aside from the snaps, is that the, the outer profile uses a spline uh, to, to make that wavy shape all the way around, but it's symmetric. And I'll show you a neat way that you can tame uh, a complicated spline in Fusion 360. All right, so let's get started. So in the program here, I'm going to start a brand new design, as always, by making a new component. Uh, if you you don't always need to make a new component, but if you don't do it at the beginning, sometimes you're out of luck if you ever decide that you need something to be uh, at a sibling level of your design. And I'm going to do a file save right at the beginning, because until you do that, Fusion 360 won't start auto-saving for you. So if you should crash or something like that in the middle of your design, you won't have the auto-save. But once you save it, it will start doing that. All right, so I'm going to start off with a sketch. And what I like about this, this part is it, it's going to turn out to be a nice one sketch design. Uh, so like I said, the outer profile is a spline. So if I were to just try to make a six pointed spline and go around a circle like that, uh, you can see there's no symmetry to it. Uh, splines are tricky to deal with in Fusion because you have so many points that you have to constrain to get that curve to go from blue to black. Uh, so the trick that I figured out is that I can use construction geometry to constrain the spline. So what I'm going to do first is make a six-pointed uh, polygon here, a hexagon. And if I remember right, that one needs to be a circumscribed hexagon at 25. And I'm going to straighten that out. So you notice that went all black because I've got a size and I've got an orientation. And then I'm going to put another hexagon on there. And for some reason, when I first made this, I did one as circumscribed and then I did one as inscribed. And you really don't have to do that, but I'm just duplicating the original measurements that I made. The difference between the two is that a circumscribed hexagon is measured from the center to the middle of an edge and an inscribed one is, made, is measured from the center to a point. And now I'm going to go constrain that to be vertical. And now what I've got here are 12 points around the perimeter that will let me define the hexagon here with a spline. So now I'm going to go back to an object line and get a spline. And I'm just going to go around the circle. And I'm allowing Fusion to automatically infer a, con a uh, coincident constraint as I get near those corners. And then back to the start. Boom. So now you can see it already starts to look like that star shape without very much effort, uh, which is great. But there's, a, there's an issue here. If I wanted to change the amount of curvature here and I start, say, dragging the control handles there, you can see, obviously, I'm only affecting one point at a time. And of course, I want some symmetry here. If I drag one, I, well, I want to drag them all. Uh, so the way to deal with that is to use a little more construction geometry. And I'm going to put a circle in there. And if I remember right, that one needs to be 60. And the purpose of the circle is so that I can make these uh, spline handles uh, coincident with that circle there. And that's going to guarantee 
that they're all the same size all the way around and that they all have the right orientation. You want them, I don't want them off at some arbitrary angle here. What I really want is I want it to be uh, perpendicular to the line that's going from that point to the center there. And so if I constrain all of these on the circle here, that's what I'm going to get. So I'm going to pick a point and I'm going to put on the circle. And you see it infers the constraint, the, the coincident constraint automatically. Now I'm not going to bother to try to get both ends of that handle over there because you can see on the other end of the handle, it's not inferring a constraint there. It's only constraining the one side. So I want to be sure that I'm getting exactly the constraints that I want. So I'm going to walk around the circle and pin one side to it and leave the other side away. And then I'm going to come back and explicitly constrain all those. And I like to do that with constraints uh, so that I, I don't accidentally get inferred constraints I don't want. And I make sure that I get all the ones I do. So now I've got uh, picked up the coincident constraint. And I'm going to click on the circle and then click on the point. And you can see it snaps into position there. Click the circle, click the point, and so forth all the way around. That one. And so now you can see, you can, I'm scanning around that circle here. Everything looks nice and symmetric. And my star shape, at least the outer curves are symmetric. The inner curves are, are still goofed up because I moved that one around. And to handle the inside uh, adjustment handles, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to make a circle, a construction circle. And this one, I think, needs to be 48 millimeters. Oops. 48 millimeters. There we go. And I'm going to go around the circle here and drag one side onto the circle. So now I say coincidence, and now I can click the circle, click the point. So now I have a spline where not only are all the fit points constrained, but all the adjustment handles are constrained as well. So I get complete symmetry all the way around. And now what's fun about this is that you can make some interesting changes to that basic star shape uh, just by changing these few parameters that describe the diameters of the circle and the sizes of those hexagons here. So look what happens if I expand that circle from 60 to 64 millimeters. I can go a little bigger, go say 68, like that. They get even closer, to, they get square and square. I could go to 72. And you can really have a lot of fun experimenting with those different sizes here. And the same thing applies to the, the hexagons as well. If I made that instead of 25, I made it 24. You can see it changes the shape somewhat. I could make it just 20, see what I get. Now you do have to be careful because if you cross the, uh, for instance, if I took this, this circle here and made it smaller and smaller until it crosses this inside diameter here of the hexagon, uh, Fusion is going to get confused and it's not going to understand what you're trying to do there. So if you wanted to experiment with that, you would have to um, draw a brand new circle and then constrain the, the, the handles on the spline to the new circle, the new smaller circle on the inside there. But this right here is the profile of this knob as I printed it here. And so now we have enough to actually start creating some of the parts here. So I'm going to make a couple new components here for the front side and the back side. And now I'm going to do some extrude operations here. So first I'll activate the front and then say extrude. I'm going to pick my profile and I'm going to extrude that six millimeters up. And then I'm going to go to the back components, activate, and extrude. I need to turn my sketch back on. Go to the bottom side, pick my profile, and negative six. And now it's starting to look like something. I'm going to make it look yellow just by giving it an appearance here. Okay, and then turn off my sketch. 
And so you can see I'm starting to get there. And so I think I will do some fillets here. I'll do a fillet on the top side. Uh, if I remember what I did in my first design, it was 3.5 millimeters. And then I'll do a fillet in the bottom side here. Same thing, 3.5. And there we go. And so now what I need to do is make the cavity inside that holds the head of the bolt and then make the hole in the face for the shank of the bolt there. So I'm going to go back to my original sketch and add some more to it. I know I'm going to need a central hole here that's going to be for a quarter inch bolt. So I can type in 0.25 inch. Even though I'm working in millimeters, I can always type in an inch dimension if I want to. Uh, and then I'm going to make a hexagon. Circumscribe polygon. And by default, you do get six sides, which is nice. Uh, and I know this needs to be uh, sized for a quarter 20 bolt, which is 7 sixteenths of an inch across the flats. Uh, but I want to add in a little bit of clearance in there as well. I think if I printed it exactly at 7 sixteenths, uh, the bolt might, might be a little tight to fit in there. So I'm going to do kind of a complicated expression in Fusion here. I'm going to say in parentheses 7 divided by 16. Now it's interpreting that as millimeters at first, so I have to change units by saying times 1 inch. And the measurement for a polygon is always from the center uh, of the polygon to a side. And really what I'm measuring here is 7 sixteenths across the flats. So I'm going to wrap that whole thing in more parentheses and divide by 2. And then to get a little bit of clearance in there, I'm going to add in 0 0.1 millimeters. And there's my hexagon. Now you can see it's blue, it's not black yet, because although I've given it a size, it doesn't have a specific orientation. So I'm going to go grab a horizontal vertical constraint, and I could pick either one of the si sides here and make that vertical. Now it goes black. So now I can go back into 3D World, and I can start doing an extrusion here. And I want the the bolt to be centered, I want the, uh, a hex, hex uh, hole in, in both the front and the back. So I'm going to do a symmetric extrude. So I'm going to pick my profile and I'm going to hover and select right through the, the body there down to the profile. Get those two profiles. This is going to be symmetric. And if I'm remembering right, it's going to be 5.5 millimeters. No, I think it's just 5 millimeters. That sounds right. And this is going to be a cut operation. And what it's going to do, it should cut into both the front and the back body and produce that hollow. Now, I can't see it until I open it up. And there it is. There's the one on the front. And I'm crawling out the back. Okay, and now I'm going to do a further extrude operation to get the, the through hole there. And that is only applied to the front part. So I'll go select that profile. I'm going to click and pause to get right through the part into the profile. And I'm going to pull it right up. Change that from new body to cut. And I will make that, I'll actually say cut all. And now under Objects to Cut, it's only listing the front part. And there we go. So I'll turn off the sketch again. And now if I turn off the back, you can see, yeah, I've got a clearance hole all the way through. So that's starting to look like something. And now you can see on this part here, I've got a, uh, a boss on the front that's raised up a little bit. So I'm going to go back to my sketch, and I'm going to make the circle for that, and then extrude that. So I'm going to edit sketch and make a circle, and I believe that that was 32 millimeters. Oops, 32. There we go. That looks about right. Finish sketch. 
And now what I'm going to do to make that extrude, I'm actually going to roll back in the timeline a little bit. I'm going to go back to right after I did my initial extrude up there. I'm going to turn my sketch on. I'm going to create an extrude. And that profile, as well as that one, and that one. And I'll extrude that up. Oops, not 22 millimeters. Nope, what happened there? Oh, I didn't extrude it starting from the right place. So I'm going to go modify that. Oops, you know what? I want to delete that. I want to get into just my yellow timeline there. Extrude. I can turn off the body. Pick the profiles quickly. Turn the body back on. I don't want to extrude from the profile plane. I want to extrude from the top surface. So I'm going to do that there and then go up two millimeters. And there we are. And now I can go fill at that and make it look a little nicer here. I can pick that edge and that edge and I'll make each one a one millimeter fillet around both edges there. And now if I roll forward, I get my hole and I've still got my hex on the inside. Great. Okay, so now it's time to make the snaps on the inside. And the way that they work is that these three holes inside the part are all tapered. And the pins themselves also have a taper to them. And the taper on the pin is a little bigger than the taper in the hole so that when I press this in place there, it's going to snap into place and there's actually a little bit of interference on there. That's what holds it in there. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is design one of them on the part and then I'll do patterns all the way to make the three pins that go around it there. So I'm going to go back to the same sketch. Now you don't have to do all of this on one sketch and sometimes you don't want to do everything on a, on a single sketch because it gets too crowded here. But I feel like this design is, is not too complicated and it's going to work fine to put it all on one sketch. So now first thing I need to do is create a circle there that defines where that hole is going to be. And that's a 10 millimeter hole. So I'm not going to try to put it in the exact place here. I'm just going to get in the neighborhood and make sure that I'm not inadvertently getting a coincident constraint somewhere I don't want it. So I'm going to just click right there and make a 10 millimeter hole. And then I want to put that in place by doing two things. I want to get it on the horizontal axis. And my favorite way of doing that is using a horizontal vertical constraint. And what I do is click the center of the circle and then click the origin. And that says align that horizontally with the origin. And now I want to put a dimension in place. And I'm going to go from there to there and I am just going to round that off to a nice even 20 millimeters. So now I've got a hole that defines uh, that, that tapered hole in the outside part there and I, now I'm going to define some other circles concentric with that to create that snap pin there. So I'm going to zoom in a bit so I can see better and I'm going to create a circle concentric with it and I want to make sure I'm not inadvertently getting some, some uh, constraints on there. And then I'm going to go dimension what I want that to be. Now this circle that I'm drawing now represents the outside radius of that snap pin at the center part where it's the thinnest. And the way I want to dimension that is rather than giving it a diameter, I want to, I want to make a measurement. Uh, I, want, I want to measure the gap between that and the outside circle. So that is going to be 0.25 millimeters. Boom. So you can see now I've got a very small gap, clearance gap in there. So right at the center of the snap pin along the vertical axis, it's not actually in contact with the yellow plastic. It's going to only be in contact uh, as it flares away from that center plane there. And then I'm going to define another circle that will give me the thickness of that snap pin. And I'm going to do it the same way. I'm going to lay it down where I know it's not going to inadvertently 
capture constraint. And then I'm going to make that, what do I make that? I think that needs to be, is it three millimeters? Let's see. Let's see what that looks like. Nope, three millimeters is way too big. I need you to be 1.5 millimeters. That looks better. And then you can see in the snap pin that it's not a complete circle. In order to allow it to squeeze in like that, I have to cut a little section of it out so it can act like a, uh, like a roll pin there. And so I'm going to go define a little pie wedge in there by making a couple of lines. So I'm going to go from there to there, and I'm going to go from there, coincident with that outer, that outer circle of the pin. And then I'm going to define an angle on there. And I tried 45 degrees, and that worked pretty well. All right, so that's all the geometry I need now to make my holes in the yellow part and then create those snap pins. So now I'm going to I'm going to do an operation that's going to affect both the front and the back, so I'm going to be in the parent object there. And I'll do an extrude. I'm going to turn off that front face. And what I want to do is extrude all of those profiles. Oops, there we go. And this is going to be a symmetric extrude. I'm going to do each side four millimeters. I made the pieces six millimeters thick, so four millimeters will not go all the way through. And I want to put the taper angle on here. And I'm going to make that four degrees of taper. So you can see it flares out a little bit. And that's not going to be a new body. That's going to be a cut. So now I've got profile plane symmetric, four millimeters in either direction with a taper angle of four degrees. OK. All right, so let's turn. Oops, did I get? No, I got to redo that because I didn't turn on my upper body here. And so under objects to cut, yeah, I've just got the back. So I'm going to turn on the front as well. And now both front and back show up in there. And I'll do my cut operation. OK, so now I'm going to turn off the sketch. And I'll go look at the front and see that I got a tapered hole. I did. There's the inside surface. You can see the taper. And then I'll turn on the back, and I got my tapered hole great. All right, so now I'm going to define the pin itself. So for that, I'm going to need a new body, or rather new component. And I'll call that snap pin. And now I'm going to turn off those two, turn my sketch back on. And now I'm going to go do and extrude. I've got to pick all the right profiles here. And so I'm going to get the whole outside perimeter. I'm going to extrude the whole inside of it as well, because I'm going to do this in two operations. One to define the outside profile, and then a second operation to define that inside profile. And because of the way I've got that, that pie wedge in there, uh, it just works out easier to do it to do it this way. Um, so this is also going to be a symmetric extrude. It's not going to go 4 millimeters. I'm only going to make it go 3.5 millimeters. I am going to put a taper on there. Now, I don't want to do the same 4 degrees because then it wouldn't touch that inside tapered hole anywhere. I want it to be a steeper angle. I'm going to make that 10 degrees. And let's see, I don't want that pie wedge in there. That's the shape I want. It looks like that from above. You can see the taper on the, the side view there. And I'm going to say OK. And now to give that a little visual contrast from the other parts, I'm going to give that a different color. All right, and now I've got to go back and do another extrude in order to hollow out the inside of that snap pin. So this is what it looks like in place there. And now actually is a good time to go take a look at, I can use the interference tool to see how much interference I've got. I have to make the, the outside part here compress the snap pin, otherwise it's not going to hold it in place here. And I want to make sure that I've got, don't have too much interference. 
And so I'm going to go pick the, the back face and the snap pin and say compute the interference here. Now that seems like an awful lot, 119 cubic millimeters. That's, that's way too much. Why is that happening there? Why is that happening? I'm going to turn on a section and get a look at the inside there. And I'll do that plane. And then where's my adjustment arrow? There it is. Come out and see how it's cutting through there. Oh, I didn't. Oh, I, I see what I did. I didn't make my tapered hole deep enough. That's why. The interference in the section tools are really, really good when you want to see how things look on the inside. All right, so is, let's see, is that my guy? Is that my guy? Boom, there it is. That's the one I want. Yep, I, I picked the wrong one here. It's not, it's not four millimeters total. It's four millimeters in either direction. Okay, and now I can try interference again in between the back face and the snap pin. There we go, a couple millimeters, two millimeters. Now you're probably asking how much interference do you want? And it's, it's I found it very experimental. Uh, I tried, um, I just tried something that looked good just to, to see how it works. And in the end it worked and you might want to try something different. Uh, if you want the snap pin to fit a little tighter, you can steepen that angle. Um, you can put less of a chamfer on it because I'm not done shaping that pin yet. So I'm going to go hollow out the inside of that pin by doing another extrude. Let's see. I want to pick all the right profiles here. I'm going to turn off the pin just so I can pick profiles. So I want that one and that one. And I'm going to go symmetric. Make sure it's a cut. And I want to go all the way through. Make sure I'm cutting the right things. Yep. Oh, I didn't put my taper on it. I'm going to match that same 10 degree taper angle. So there's my snap pin. It's looking good. So you need it's a compromise between being thin enough that it can bend without breaking and not being so thin that it doesn't give you any any holding force in there. Um, but another thing that I, I did in order to get it to press into the hole easily is there's a little bit of a chamfer on that edge there. So when I press it down in the hole and press in like that, it'll actually compress a bit and snap into place. So I'm going to put a little bit of a chamfer on the two edges there. And again, this was just try and see what works. If you use different kinds of plastic, you might get different results. Uh, you've got to just, just figure out what works the best for you. All right, so now I'm going to turn the back back on, and now I'm going to see how much interference I've got. I'm going to have less because I took away some material from that pin. And I'll say Compute, and 0.764, and that, that sounds familiar. That's what it was on the one that I'm actually showing you right here. I'll turn off my sketch. Okay. And now really about the only thing left to do is pattern that, those features around there. So I get three holes and three snap pins. Uh, so now I'm going to go in, I'll make sure I'm working in my outer parent object there. I'm going to create a circular pattern. And I like whenever possible to pattern features because then you can just point to things in the timeline rather than try to pick all of the faces. And sometimes there's just a lot of faces there. So the thing I want to pattern is that and the, let's see, I think I'm going to do this as two, two separate operations. First, I'm going to make the holes and I want to turn on the top as well. All right, so I've got my object selected. It says two selected because this extrude affected both the upper and the lower part there, the front and the back. I'm going to go select my axis, which is the z-axis. By default, you get three, which is what I want. So I'll go ahead and do that. 
and let's see what I get. Yep, I've got three holes in the back side, and I've got three holes in the front side. Or do I? No, maybe I don't. I don't. Let's see, let's figure out what happened there. Wait a minute. Is that one even there? Maybe that one's not there. I'm going to turn off my snap pin. I don't even have my first one. What happened? I'm going to go back to the operation that created it. Objects to... Oh, I didn't have both parts selected. There we go. Okay. So now I'll go back and look at the front. There we go. I've got my tapered holes. The great thing about Fusion is you can always go back in time in your timeline and fix the mistakes that you made. Okay, so now I'm going to do another pattern operation to create the three snap pins as well. I'll turn off the front so I can see better. I'm going to create a circular pattern of this time components and the component I want is my snap pin and my axis is the z-axis and I've got my three and that looks good and there we go and so now I've got my front and my back they're all finished pretty much I've got my three snap pins so you can see I've got now three copies of the snap pin in there and now the only thing left to do really is a little bit of uh, uh, chamfering on the on the bottom surface the surface is going to print down on the 3d printer plate and I always like to put a little bit of a chamfer surfaces there so that if there is any any a little bit of flash it won't interfere with with the the uh, thing going together well and if I put a nice chamfer on the edge here it'll be possible to, to get it back apart with your fingernails there once you've snapped it together this one I've snapped together and apart taken apart again countless times and it's still snapping okay uh, but it did stick a little bit better on that first that first snap there so having a little bit of a chamfer in there really helps you get your fingernail in there to pry it apart uh, so I'll do that separately on each part here I'm gonna work only on the front so I can pick chamfer look at the bottom face I'm gonna pick the outer perimeter and I'm going to leave those alone because even if there is a little bit of flash, that's not going to hurt. I want there to be uh, some surface there for the pin to grab onto. So I'm going to put a 0.5 millimeter chamfer around the outside edge and around the hex hole. And what the heck, I'm going to do that hole as well. And then I'm going to come back onto the backside and do pretty much the same thing. Six sides of my hex and the outer perimeter will all get 0.5 millimeter. And now it's about done. It's ready to go into the slicer here. Now I didn't bother modeling a bolt. Uh, I could have made a, a quarter 20 bolt model, but I know what a quarter 20 bolt looks like. I've measured it so I know I've got the right dimensions here. Uh, you could go to GrabCAD maybe and find one, or you could you could model one up yourself. But for common hardware, hardware items, often I, I just leave them out of the design there. Uh, and so now all that's left to do is export this so I can bring it into the slicer program. And what I am going to do is simply turn on the front and the back and one snap pin. I really don't need to export all three snap pins because they're all identical. And I'm going to go up here right click on the parent object save as stl binary format is fine i can say one file per body that's important because otherwise if you bring them into slicer uh, if you export just one file they all come in together in a slicer and you can't uh, can't work with them separately here um, set refinement to high that's all i need to do and you it opens up a file save dialog that's got a a file name in here and it uses that as a template for a file name. It'll take what you give it here, threaded knob in this case, and then append on the component name and then the body names in there. So you're going to get multiple files 
um, all starting with threaded knob here. So I'm going to save as STL. Okay. Oh, they went into the snap together threaded knobs folder. That makes sense. There they are. Right there. So I've got, it makes these real long file names here. I've got, oh, it turns out I did get three copies of my snap pin after all. I didn't intend to, but I don't need all three. I can just delete two of them. And now I'll go into Prusa Slicer here, load them up, make sure everything looks okay. All right, so I'm gonna, ooh, new version available. Well, I'll get that later. So now I'm gonna go import. Okay, and they all come in right on top of each other here. And so what you've gotta do is one at a time, select one. Um, actually, no, I can just space them out like that. Yeah, they came in. Oh, one came in upside down, so I've got to flip that one around. So I'm going to click that S to select it. Click this place on face command there, and then flip it over. I can go look at the bottom side. Yep, that looks like the bottom. And now if I want to get more than one of these, and I do... Set number of instances to three. There we go. Space them out. Okay. And you can print this. I had good luck at 0.15 millimeter. And I'll slice it. Let's see what we get. In hour 47 minutes. That's not too bad. Uh, so you'll want to put support in that central hole there. The Snap pin holes here don't need support because it can bridge that top surface there. It can do the whole perimeter, and then since there's no interruption in that surface, it can just bridge straight across. The one exception is that because it has that central hole. So I'm going to go to my front surface here and turn on support material and pick generate support. It's telling me it wants to detect bridging parameters, the perimeters, that's fine. And I'll slice again and see what I get. And now I should, yeah, I can see some support material in there. And I'll look at the bottom side. Let's put support in the front and not in any of those other holes because it knows it can bridge. And so now all I have to do is save the file and take it to the printer, and out it comes. And like I said, um, a nice feature of, the, of designing it this way using um, construction geometry to constrain the splines on there is if you want to make a different a different shape you can just experiment with changing the 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 sizes of that there so if i make that outside circle a little bigger make it 68 millimeters i get a different different design on there so you can really play with this and make a lot of different ones and i've, I've done uh, quite a few of those. I did a knob looks just very similar to this with triangles instead of hexagons and i've got a three star three lobe knob here and these are all up on Thingiverse here, and I'll have a link to that in the video description. Uh, so I hope you found this interesting. This was a fun part to make. I like making a nice little one sketch part sometimes. Uh, keep it nice and simple. And uh, it's actually a useful thing. And what I like about it is, although it's a 3D printed object, it doesn't really scream 3D printed unless you look at it closely and you recognize that that texture is 3D printed because I've got the two faces for the, the, the two faces that are down on the plate. They go against each other and they're hidden on the inside. You don't see them there. So I thought that was pretty neat. So I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, give it a like, make a comment below, something you liked or didn't like, something you'd like to see. Have fun. Thanks. Bye-bye.